After escaping slavery in Egypt, the Israelites set out towards the Promised Land. While traveling near Mount Sinai, God gave the Israelites' leader Moses specific commands about the best way to live. Some of these commands were about the exact way that the Israelites should worship God, including where to worship. For some time, Moses had set up a tent outside the Israelites' camp where he met face to face with God. When Moses entered the tent, a pillar of cloud would stay at the entrance of the tent. When the Israelites saw the cloud, they would each stand at the entrance of their own tents, worshiping God. They called this place the Tent of Meeting. But now, God gave specific instructions to Moses to build a new place of worship. So Moses gathered together all of the Israelites and spoke to them. This is what the Lord has commanded, Moses told them. From what you have, take an offering for the Lord. Moses then listed out all of the specific materials that were needed to build this new tent, which would be called the Tabernacle. He asked the Israelites to volunteer to donate the materials needed from what they already owned. Everyone who was willing brought their materials as offerings to God. They brought gold jewelry, such as earrings, rings, and ornaments. They brought silver, bronze, and wood. They brought colorful yarn and linen, goat hair and leather, just as Moses had requested. The leaders of Israel also brought their precious stones and gems. Using these materials, skilled artisans and workmen constructed the tabernacle. For the first time in their lives, the Israelites had a specific place where they could gather to worship God and to bring their animal sacrifices for the priests to offer on their behalf. I met a guy this week, and we were talking about some things, and uh, I invited him to church today to come here. Tim, the, the guy I met, he's, he's black, all right? And he was at a service where, and some of you are going to say, Tim, you shouldn't tell this story. But no, no it's okay. Um, we did a funeral service here. It was probably one of the toughest services I've ever done this week. It, uh, the history of this, of, of this 34-year-old, I mean, 44-year-old woman was just absolutely the worst I've ever heard. Um, take the worst novel you've ever read about somebody's history, life, uh, and double it, and you might come close to what this lady went through in her world. And uh, uh, she had a 14-year-old son, and uh, she's, she's white, her husband, okay, the father of the child was black. And Elijah, great personality, 14 years old. How this kid has turned out the way is absolutely amazing. It is a miracle. He is incredible. And when I met with him to prepare for his mother's service, he said, you got to understand, my mother was unique. He said, she was white and she liked everything black. And he said her favorite dessert, okay, was vanilla ice cream swirl, all right? That was, that was the perfect world for her. And so one of the guys who had a service, I said, you know what, come Sunday because we have swirl here at New Hope, all right? I said, my twin brother Tim and I, I said, the only way you tell Tim and Tim apart is because I can't sing. And, uh, and so I'm hoping he makes it. His name is Charles. I hope Charles makes it here today. But welcome. It's always good to have Tim. If you're new to New Hope, Tim, Tim was with us one Sunday a month. He's part of our music staff. He just only gets to be here one Sunday a month. He's involved in ministry in prisons and in Japan and other parts of the world. And we're happy to have him on the Sunday that we get him. So thanks for coming to New Hope. I hope you had a great New Year. We missed you last week, but I'm sure you didn't miss me. Uh, you had a much better looking stand in, all right, last week. But I messed up big time. I should have been here last week and let Corey be here this week. I would have much rather preached on time than money, okay? Um, so uh, you visitors are now already thinking, okay, I should leave. Every time I go to church, they preach on money. Um, let me get this out. I've only preached on money twice my entire 30 years of ministry, all right? So this will be number three, all right? We'll get it out of the way and we'll move on next week. But if you are visiting New Hope for the very first time, welcome. Our pleasure to have you here. There are visitor cards in the pew in front of you. I would love for you to fill that visitor card out, put it in the offering bag, and next week through the mail, we'll send you information that tells you about the church. We promise we will not beat on your door. We will not bother you on the phone. But through the mail, send you information we hope will answer most of your questions. 
Um, there's a couple of things out here in the pavilion that I want to draw your attention to. There is a new book out there that goes along with the series that we are in, Think, Act, and Be. This is called the Believe Series. We've spent the first 10 weeks looking at the 10 key truths of the Bible that we build our life on. We are now about to finish the 10 key practices, and those practices line up with those 10 truths. We put into practice the truth that we know. We obey it, and that's called a practice. And when we believe the truth and when we practice the truth, God, with his presence in us, produces his character through our lives, and we will look at the 10 key virtues that parallel the truths and the practices in our life. And so you will find out there, and we are a beta church. What that means is we're one of 30 churches across the United States that is testing this um, uh, this study out, and next year they will produce, and many other churches will probably engage in it. And so we are slow getting some of the materials, all right, because uh, they're still writing some of them. They made changes as a result of some of your suggestions to us that we passed on to them. They threw away 90,000 copies of a book uh, and redid them because of suggestions that you and folks from other uh, beta churches have made. And so what they have released now is the book. It's kind of the basis of what we preach about every Sunday called Think, Act, and Believe. And this would be helpful in your small group studies as well. Uh, can you figure out what the price might be for this book? Ten, five, or free. It's kind of the New Hope price range here, all right? Um, this book is normally about a $14.95 book, all right? It will be available out there for ten, five, or free, whichever is uh, fits your pocketbook the best, Okay. And uh, they're stacked up out there. It's an honor system. There's a basket out there. You'll also find more of the Believe Bibles. If you're visiting with us, you'll see some in the pew in front of you. Certainly use it during the service, but if you'd like one to take home, there's some more out there in the pavilion, and the price is 10 5 or free. All right, works out really well that way. Um, Sign-up sheet going around. There's just there's three pages, but it's all the same thing. If you ride a motorcycle of any brand or version, all right, um, I was told I had to say it this way, if you start at the top and you ride a Harley. You have to understand what they were pointing at me at that moment, okay? No, I'm kidding. Uh, whether you ride a Harley, a BMW, a Honda, uh, a Kawasaki, a Yamaha, have I left? An Indian, all right. Triumph, a moped, okay? <laughs> Whatever it is that has two wheels that you ride that has a motor, all right? You can't do a bike with this. They won't wait for you. Uh, on Sunday, February the 8th, it's going to be a motorcycle ride Sunday. So if you come to the 8 o'clock service, actually you have to come to the 8 o'clock service to go on the ride, show up at the 8 a.m. service, you park your motorcycle out here in front of the sanctuary. We used to do this annually and. Um, We've missed it for about two years. So one of the guys said, okay, we're going to do it again. And so on February 8th, come to 8 o'clock service. You'll then go for a, a ride for breakfast to the Red Caboose out on Academy and Shaw. From there then, you will take a back road ride to Traver, all right, to the Chiefs, okay? Bravo Farms, thank you. Bravo Farms at Traver, okay? So uh, they want you to sign up so they can make reservations at both places for breakfast and uh, uh, brunch might get there before lunch but ice cream all right yeah good ice cream so sign up they would love to have you go on that motorcycle ride with them okay let's see here this coming Tuesday is the senior lunch all right so on Tuesday the 13th if you are 55 or older you qualify if you've never been just show up if you've been you know the routine it's the first one of the year tonight we have a small group launch here at the church, 6 o'clock right here in the sanctuary. If you are a current member of a small group, we want you here. We want to talk to you about some, some good things, all right? We want you to be up to speed with, with um, some directions and goals that we have for small group this year. If you have never been in a small group, but you filled out a card and said, I want to be, show up tonight. You will get placed in a small group. If you haven't filled out a card but would like to be in a small group, show up tonight, all right? We will auction you off. To the highest bidder, all right? No, we'll see that you get placed in a small group. But we'd love to have you come tonight. Probably will only be about a 45-minute meeting. It's not going to be long, and there's going to be some light refreshments afterwards. So 6 o'clock, we'd love to have you here. Uh, investigate in your bulletin the plug-in area. There's a lot of areas that you can serve, and it tells you the contact person's name. You can 
call the office and say, hey, I'd like to talk to somebody about this, and they'll get you hooked up. Let me just tell you one pressing need right now I know we have. We need more volunteers to help out in our nursery, our infant nursery. Let me tell you what happened on the Sunday right before Christmas. After one of the services was over, I had a lady who does not attend here regularly come up to me and say, Pastor, I came to church today because I wanted to see and hear the Christmas message. But she said, when I took my baby over to the nursery, there was a sign on the door that said, take him to the toddler room. Well, brand new parents who have their first baby aren't necessarily overly inclined to want to take their baby in where there's lots of other crawling kids and playing kids and stuff. They want a safe, and I understand that. And I was told the reason was we didn't have enough volunteers. So if you want an area to serve and make a difference in somebody's life, say, hey, I'd be willing to volunteer to work with our director in our nursery program and fill one of the slots, one Sunday a month, all right, two Sundays a month. Come to 915 service, fill in at 1045. Come to 1045, fill in at 915. Come to 8. You, you get the drift, all right? You got the drift, right? You don't volunteer to serve and don't come to worship. Just, just Was that subtle? All right. Anyway. Uh, that's just one area, but you can find lots of other, but that's a very simple area. If you love babies and care, that's a great place for you to, for you to fill in. Um, can you believe it? 20 days from now, eight men and women representing New Hope, working with 1040i, we will be in Paris on our way to Doropo, Ivory Coast, Africa. We will be gone for 14 days. Over 200 children, we have been told, over 200 children are going to be in this village attending the Vacation Bible School that Shelley and Robin from our church are going to be directing the first time they've ever had a Vacation Bible School event in that part of the world. Um, there are going to be doctors and nurses and construction worker and teachers, over 40 of them from other parts of the U.S. and Canada. Uh, a dormitory for 30 junior high students in a village will be completed. Bunk beds will be made and quilts will be placed in each one of those beds made by women from our church. They anticipate doing over 100 major surgeries in nine days and nearly 1,000 other Avorians will be seen for a variety of health needs. They have no medical facility really like this in their area. So please be praying for the benefits of education and health practices, but also please be praying for the transformation of men and women's lives from sinners to saints. For that's the purpose for it all. So please be praying for us. 20 days from now, we leave. Some names for you to remember to pray for this week. This has been a busy week around New Hope. You have allowed your facilities and your staff to be used to minister to several families this week. Uh, the Yoakum family had a memorial service here on Thursday. The Myers family on Friday. The Hill and Green families yesterday. On top of that, we've met with other families with services pending. Glenn Matson's brother from our 8 o'clock service, his brother John in Bakersfield died this past week. Um, the Freeman family I'll be meeting with on Tuesday. Their 24-year-old daughter died this past week. The Stonehouse and Millar families, and we've talked about both of them recently, and those services are being scheduled and planned. Uh, Naomi Millar's service will be on Saturday the 24th of this month. And then the Stonehouse service will be February the 21st of next month. Uh, some women from our church, Mary Ann has gone home from the rehab center. Uh, continue to pray for Rich Smith's mom and her heart. Uh, Mikey is improving, but there's still some infection in her leg. Um, Wanda, who's having been going through cancer treatment for breast cancer in our 8 o'clock service, will be having uh, surgery on Tuesday at St. Agnes Hospital. And then Elaine's mom, Elaine sitting to my right over here, passed away this week. So lots of folks just to be praying for. A challenging first month of the year so far for many families. Um, thanks for being here today. If when you leave today and you pick up any of the books, look at the wall of truth out there. If you have not signed, this is our second wall of truth. It is the ten practices that we've been preaching about that are based on the ten key truths. If you haven't signed it, but you say, I believe these are practices I need to be engaged in, put your name on the wall. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward, wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offerings. Late, looks like the ladies are going to wait on us today. Thank you very much. Would you join with me as we pray? Father, thanks for life and the privilege of sharing life with you. 
Father, the scripture says that you are so interested in spending time with us that um, you describe it this way. Jesus stands at the door of our life and he knocks. And he said, I'd like to come in and hang out with you. Father, because you were God, your son could easily knock the door down. But Father, his desire is not to have authority over us, but it's to have fellowship with us. He's not a dictator who demands that we trust him. He is a savior who longs for us to accept him. And so, Father, I trust that we not only accept him as a savior to get us out of hell and into heaven, but, Father, I also trust that we accept him as the source of life so that between now and our death, we get to experience life with him every moment of every day whether I'm enjoying my favorite hobby or whether I'm engaged in the act of worship or whether I'm involved in kingdom service of ministering to others, whether it's the homeless, whether it's the addicted, whether it's the careless, whether it's the grieving, whatever hurt somebody has, that you're using us to be a source of your life being expressed to them. May we share this incredible adventure that you have in store for us. Our Father, we thrust to you the needs that we've already talked about today. So many needs for comfort, for encouragement, for support. Needs, Father, of peace as they wait for surgery or wait for the results of tests. Needs, Father, for patience as people find themselves in a waiting room, waiting for answers and clarity and direction. And in the midst of all of these troublesome valleys of life, you promise us your presence you don't promise us the absence of trouble, but you promise us your presence in the midst of our trouble. You tell us you'll never leave us nor forsake us. Father, if there's a man or a woman sitting close to us in this service right now, give us the eyes to see what they may need from us, whether it's a kind word, whether it's the offering of a helping hand, whether it's something as simple and yet familiar as a hug. May we just have eyes to see the way in which we can help the hurts and the needs and the challenges of others. For the privilege of giving and sharing today, Father, we say thanks. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, in two minutes, there are going to be folks uh, standing and cheering for Dallas Cowboys. And, and, and they may end up with a broken heart, all right? I, I'm just saying, okay? Uh, there will be folks standing and cheering Denver and Indianapolis. And um, you guys topped them all. You stood and cheered the one who will never disappoint you. You stood and cheered the one who will never, ever let you down. In spite of how many times we let him down, he never does let us down. Uh, there's also a table out in the pavilion that uh, Teddy and Corey will be manning and womaning. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, uh, regarding small groups, so if you're fairly new and you kind of want to watch all this talk about small groups, you can stop out at the table and ask about it or you've known about it, but you kind of want to know how are things going to work tonight, stop by there. They'll be happy to answer um, all of your questions. All right, uh, big thanks to Corey for filling in for me last week. Uh, you certainly had somebody a whole lot better looking to look at last week than you do most Sundays. Um, and uh, thank you so very much, Corey, for filling in. I I'm going to run with that one, whatever it was. Um, it was perfect timing for her to, uh, to introduce and relaunch small groups before our meeting tonight. I do wish the subject had been flip-flopped. I would have rather preached on time than tithing. Um, if you are new to New Hope today, I am so very, very sorry. Uh, please come back on another Sunday, all right? Um, if you've been here for a while, you know this is a subject that we rarely, rarely talk about. Uh, in fact, two years ago, I preached two sermons for the very first time on the subject of giving and tithing. It's the first time in 30 years. Um, uh, I was always afraid I would mess stuff up, and um, I'm, I thought after I'd preached on it two years ago, I would be a little less uh, fearful today, but I'm not. I'm still just as terrified of the subject. Uh, 
And, and, and so, please, if you're visiting with us, know this is, I've heard over the years, you know, every time I go to church, they always preach on money. And so I'm apologizing before I ever get started. Uh, I will tell you this. Here's what happened at New Hope. New Hope has always been a generous congregation. Our needs have always been met here. Uh, but the following month, two years ago, uh, our giving at New Hope increased over 25%. That's, so what that taught me was is there are folks who really just, they're not offended by the subject, we just don't know, or we know and we need to be reminded. And so um, remember, if you're visiting today, uh, have a nice nap, okay? That'll be just, that'll, that will be just fine. To, yeah. Did he tithe? Oh, 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 we're back on football. All right, all right, all right. Okay, all right. Go home and read the sports page after the scriptures, okay? Um, uh, to kind of acquiesce from what uh, Corey introduced to you last week and what we're going to talk to you today, it's this idea of whether it's our time or talents or tithe, it's the idea that in this, in this thing called fellowship with God, whether we call it church, whether we call it Christianity, whether we call it kingdom work, however you describe it, but, but those who have a relationship with God, we are not called to have this relationship in isolation. We are first of all called to have it in relationship with God, and then God challenges us. Once we are his adopted children, he encourages us to spend time with his family. And he says, why? Because I can get a whole lot more accomplished in this world for my kingdom's sake when you are living together than when you are living apart. And uh, in a book I've been reading over the last uh, two months, uh, just so happens at the tail end of the book, just in time for today, uh, came across this quaint little illustration. If you're like me, you are clueless when it comes to classical music. There are a few exceptions in here. Gene and a few others, you have a lot more knowledge of classical music than I do. Some of you are cultured, and you have heard of Eric Whitaker. How many of you have heard of Eric Whitaker? Gene's nodding his head. Anybody else? Okay. All right. All right. Good. Ethan. All right. So two cultured people in this whole congregation. <laughs> Eric Whitaker is a world famous classical composer. I've only heard about him because he gave a TED talk that someone recommended to me. A few years ago, Whitaker decided to conduct a fun little experiment. He wrote a song. He posted the sheet music on his blog, and he invited people around the world to sing the various harmonies of his song. The, get the idea? If you sang solo, then you would sing the solo part. If you sang tenor, you would sing the tenor part. And what you were to do was do a selfie, okay? You, you were to video yourself singing this part or playing this instrument and doing that part. All right, you with me? The idea was for individuals everywhere to sing into a camera, post their videos on YouTube. Eric used the posts and created a master track with him conducting so everybody was joined together. All right, now really, he wasn't conducting, he just laid all the tracks down together. All right, you, you kind of with me on that? Um, word caught on slowly. People sang and recorded their parts. The videos were posted. Eric hired a videographer to weave all of the videos together. The final result was staggering. One perfect song that featured a virtual choir of 185 voices from 12 countries, all flawlessly synced together. In the first two months of its release, the video received more than one million hits. Eric tried the experiment again a year later. This time, the numbers jumped from 185 to over two thousand people who sang in the virtual choir and again the final product was a masterpiece he's done it two more times and it's gotten over four thousand voices who've joined together and then he did a youth one you had to be under 18 and sing your parts and put it on And there were over 600 young people around the world who did this and as I read that I thought wow that really is what God is asking of us in the church to do to take our individual times and talents and treasures that he's given to us, sync them together for the greater good rather than just our personal good. 
There's not a one of those 200 and some odd first voices who sang that anybody had a clue to who they were. They would have never got a million hits on YouTube all by themselves. But put together, it became extremely effective. And that is the principle that God has functioned with under since the beginning of time. So now, but before I really jump with both feet into the midst of today's sermon, let me just offer some things out of society as a perspective for us to think and pray about. You see, in the culture in which we live in today, in 2015, you would certainly get the impression that many believe that money is king. It is the prime authority. I can preach about being stewards of our time and the abilities that God has given us, or Corey can, and rarely does anybody get too upset. I can encourage us to consider that all the time that we have each day is a gift from God, and therefore we should consider how he wants to use it, and nobody walks out of church very annoyed or exasperated. I can encourage us to consider the abilities we've been given by God and how we can use these gifts to go all in and bring him glory and honor, and rarely will anyone roll their eyes at me from the pew. What I sense, and maybe this is more about me than it is about you, maybe what I'm about to say isn't even true, what I sense when I talk and challenge folks to examine the scriptures, not my opinion, but to examine the scriptures concerning the use of our money, our hands automatically clench. Our checkbooks get held close. And our hearts become like Teflon. Nothing is going to stick from today's message. Most of us want to tune out by saying something like this, I work hard for my money and ain't no preacher going to tell me what to do with it. And you are absolutely right. Take nothing any preacher tells you. All I'm asking you today is to consider what God may tell all of us. We as Americans have a real problem with money. We've taken the view of ownership rather than stewardship when it comes to our money. Here's something that I have discovered to a degree I never knew before I made my first trip to Africa. People who have nothing are far more generous than a nation who seems to have everything. And that's pretty sad. I will assure you that this is a major contributor to the problem that plagues us in America at the present time. We who believe so much in doing what we think is best with our money filed more bankruptcies this last decade than in any other time in the history of the world. The question must be asked, do we really know what's best when it comes to caring for our financial resources, how to spend it, how to save it, how to give it, and where? The poor management of America's finances is troublesome and it's peril for us, perilous for us as a nation. But it's also deadly for the followers of Jesus. I can say without hesitation that there is absolutely nothing that will influence us to not witness. And there is nothing that will damage our witness as a follower of Jesus more quickly than financial mismanagement. It is very difficult to chat, it's, it's very challenging and difficult to share our faith in front of creditors who we do not and cannot pay. So this matter of finances is not just about what we give, but about the kind of influence we exhibit in the community that we are a part of. Let's jump in with both feet. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7. It's on the first page of the chapter in your Believe. How many of you read your chapter in the Believe Bible this week? Good. Take a nap. Um, God said it pretty well in that chapter, all right? He did a great job. Uh, I love the key verse. He says, since you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and complete earnestness and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel, finish it for me, in the grace of giving. Not in the law of giving. Notice this. So many times we get on this subject of, of time, and, but Tim, that's, that's law. No, it isn't. You got to understand this whole perspective biblically of tithing started before there was ever a law. Okay, Jacob started it before Moses ever was given ten commandments. And and just a side note, 
though Jesus said, I have come to fulfill the law, not to destroy it. Jesus said, I've come to do what you couldn't do. You could not keep the law perfectly. I can, so I will do it on your behalf so that now with my presence in you, you'll be able to keep it. But we keep it not out of legislation, but we keep it out of grace. You see, nowhere in the New Testament does the New Testament say it's okay to lie now. Thou shalt not lie is still applicable. Nowhere in the New Testament does it say thou can commit adultery. It still says, no, don't. Why? Because these reflect the character of God. God is not a liar. God is not an adulterer. So he's asking us through his law in the Old Testament, live, live my character. Now what he tells us in the New Testament is no longer do you have to attempt to do that out of the own strong, willful decision in your own life, but by the grace of God that you have received, you now have my son, the Lord Jesus Christ, living in you and what he did once for 33 years in his own life on earth, he, through the person of the Holy Spirit in your life, is prepared to do it again in you. So excel in this grace of giving for God by his grace and his only begotten son to us. You see, God gave to us all that he had, and he did it by grace. And he's asking us to give to him, surrender to him all that we have, and to do it, how? By grace. For children, there is a big difference between have to and get to. By the way, let me say this before I forget. I have no idea what any of y'all give. Okay? I, 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 I'm not the one who counts the money. Okay? There's only two guys who do that, and they're IRS retirees. Okay? Um, so so I, I have no idea. So don't say, hey, Tim's talking to me. I have no idea. I feel better now. For, for children... There's this big difference between have to and get to. You have to go to the doctor and get a shot. You have to wait here and be quiet until I'm finished. You get to go have an ice cream. You get to go pick a toy out of a store because you were so patient. Early on in life, we learn to draw a line to divide activities we perceive to be fun or boring. We learn to draw the line between that which is good or bad. We learn the difference between what is positive and what is negative. As adults, I think we still experience plenty of these have to and get to moments in life. I have to go to church or I get to go to church. I have to go to church at 8 so I can get to see the Cowboys play at 10. There were about 12 of those this morning, all right? But some of these areas can move from one extreme to another, depending on the person and our circumstances. And giving certainly fits such a description, particularly in giving to God's kingdom work. One person finds great joy in giving regularly to support kingdom and church ministry, while another views it as a, a, a heavy burden to bear. But what marks the difference in the two perspectives? What draws the line between joy and drudgery? What delineates the boundaries between generosity and greed brings us to a key question. How do I best use my resources to serve God and others? I want to say that question again, and I want, you to, I want some of you to feed back to me. Why is, this a key, why is this a very important question worded the way it is? How do I use my best resources to serve God and others? What makes that such a key question? Attitude, yeah, good, okay. That's good, but it's not the one I'm looking for. Your heart, yeah, yeah. Who said that? Good job. That's my small group leader. Yeah. Notice what it says. What, what did Jesus say are the two greatest things for us to know, remember, and obey? Love the Lord your God with all that you are, and love your neighbor as yourself. On these two truths hang all the law and all the prophets. Everything hangs on those two. So, with the greatest things that Jesus ever had to say being those two things, this question is so pertinent. How do I best use what God has given to me for the purpose of serving God and serving others and keeping the two commands he says are the greatest? Historians tell us, that when soldiers in the Middle Ages came to faith in Jesus and were baptized, 
the event very often came with a rather unique twist to it. The warrior would keep his right arm up out of the water. The symbolic point intended was that the arm used for wielding his sword and killing could not be committed and surrendered to the Lord yet, as was the rest of his body. The decision was certainly an odd attempt to show that the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. And today it seems like many Christians, I'm not talking about New Hope because I don't know what the percentages are. What I do know statistically across the United States, less than 3% of people who are members of church congregations give their tithe. 3%. So it seems like many Christians hold their right arms out of the water as well, but they're not holding their sword. It's as if to say, Lord, you can have everything except this. Listen to what Paul said to a young preacher by the name of Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, verses 9 and 10. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation. Let me pause. First thing to notice is Paul did not say getting rich was a sin. He's very clear on that. What he did say was those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. This parallels what Jesus said himself during his life on earth when he said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into heaven. And I got to tell you, until I, was, until I was in my mid-20s or late 20s, I heard that story, and this is the visual I got. I got my grandmother sitting in her living room with a sewing needle and a piece of thread and with bifocals, that was the view, and I thought, okay, it is absolute impossibility for a camel with two humps to ever get through, so there's no way you could be rich and go to heaven. That was a visual that I had, though I know it wasn't consistent. It's the visual that I had. And, and then I, I came across a historian uh, and, and, and Bible commentator by the name of William Barclay who did a great job helping me figure through that. You see, we have to take the culture of the time. What was the eye of a needle? It wasn't this, this needle I was thinking of. It was a small gate. It was a small gate. You see, in those days, larger cities were protected from other countries and marauders by walls. And each wall had a large entrance. And, of course, merchants did their best who were traveling from one city to another. They did their best to get to a city before it got dark so they could bring in their caravan of camels and, and beasts that were carrying their product, and they could get inside the walls and have safety because outside the walls, marauders could steal their stuff. But you see, the cities didn't want marauders or enemies coming in at night either, so they closed their gates. So if you were a merchant caravan and you arrived at Jerusalem after dark, all the gates were closed. You had one of two choices. You could stay right outside the gates and risk marauders, or you could go to some extra work in order to get in. You see, there was a small gate inside the big gate. It was called the eye of the needle. They would open up that small gate, and a camel could get on its knees with its burden off, and it could get in to the city. And then the merchants would have to hand carry the product in, but they would be safe. See, it wasn't impossible. It was just challenging. And what Jesus was telling us and what Paul is intimating to us here is, is that wealth tends to become a burden that distracts us from the simplicity of a relationship with God. Not that it is impossible. And there are examples of wealthy people in the Scripture who were lovers and followers of God and they, they didn't allow their finances to become a burden. And so what are the keys that make that possible? The second part of 1 Timothy 6, 9 through 10 says this, for the love of money, often the love of gets cut off of that, and we say money is the root of all evil. No, it's not, and God never said that. It says, but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from faith and pierced themselves 
with many griefs. I know I've said this, have you? When I've been strapped, I've said, you know, if I just had a little more money, all my problems would be solved. And Paul is telling us quite the opposite. He's telling us often the more money, the more grief. Of the 38 parables that Jesus told in the Bible, 16 of them deal with how to handle possessions. All told, 288 verses in the Gospels. This I find fascinating. 288 verses in the Gospels. One out of every 10. How much is that? Isn't that fascinating? Refers to money. I just find that such a coincidence. Over 2,000 Bible verses talk about our personal resources compared to approximately 500 on prayer and fewer than 500 on faith. We must not conclude from these statistics that Jesus' heart was focused on money, but rather that Jesus knew that ours would be. His teaching continually directs us towards all that we have, including our money and possessions, to love him and to love others. Key idea, I give my resources to fulfill God's purposes. God's great grace should move us to think not as though we are required to give, but as though we are privileged to get to give. The Apostle Paul writes, each of you should give what you've decided in your heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let me read that one one more time. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. In just about three minutes, let me break that verse down, very simply if we can. Um, when I was in school in a j journalism class, uh, I was taught five questions, and maybe um, if I'm wrong, the former editor of the Beacon, can correct me, but who, what, when, where, why, and how? Key questions to ask in an interview. Who? Who is Paul talking about as he writes this verse in 2 Corinthians? He says, each of, yeah, each of you. Who's left out? Nobody's left out. No, who's included? Everybody. This is kind of a plural singular, okay? Each which means there's more than just one, otherwise he wouldn't have said each. So, each. so all of us must make a personal decision. It's kind of like the story I read to you at the very beginning. Everybody had to choose to make the selfie video so that it could all be put together for the greater glory. Each of you, none of us are left out. What? Who do what? Each of us should do what? Give. The, was there another option made available? N not another option. I didn't write it, but I, I, I went through that verse about 12 times, looking for an option, none given, no exception made. Each, each give. How? How do we get to this point to where each give? Paul said, decide where? In your heart. Interesting. A choice in the heart. Thoughtful choice to be made under the influence of the one who sits on the throne of your life. The heart, that term heart is used in two different ways in the Bible. The term heart is used as the seat of emotion, and the term heart is used as the seat of authority in your life. Where and how you make decisions. So either way you want to use that word here, I find it fascinating. Who sits on the seat of your emotions? Who sits on the seat of authority in your decisions? Who runs your life? You or God? And the answer that will come to the choice we must make is going to determine a lot how we abide by this passage. Another how here. Decide in your heart. Don't give reluctantly or forcibly. Thoughtful choice should influence healthy emotions. If we have given God the seat of authority in our decision making, then it should be easy to give great, excel in the gift, in the grace of giving. And we should do it then cheerfully rather than reluctantly. Don't ever give because the preacher forced me to. No, give because who sits on the seat of authority in your life? And why? Because God loves a cheerful giver. Some of you are saying, does that mean God will love me more if I give more? No. 
Do you love the child in your, in your family who obeys better? Do you love them more than the one who doesn't? No. You love them both. You love them both, all right? You love them both unconditionally. If, if you're a good parent, you love both your kids unconditionally. Both, all, how many ever you got, all right? You love them unconditionally. Do you appreciate the one more that obeys? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's what God's telling us here. God appreciates his children who reflect his character. God gave gracefully. He asks us, give as he gave to us. Who did he give? His one and only son. All he's asking from us is the narrow. I'm kidding on that, guys, by the way. The two most significant examples for me in the Bible of generosity did not come from anybody rich or middle class. For me, the two significant examples of generosity in the Bible came in the form of two widows, one out of the Old Testament, one out of the New Testament. One gave a mite, one gave a meal. Jesus saw the widow give her mite, and today's money it would be about $2. It would be about $2 in value. The other one gave a meal so the prophet could live and continue his work. As devoted followers of Christ, our daily prayer should become, Lord, how do you want me to use the resources you've entrusted to me? This includes our wallets and our purses, the cash, the checkbooks, debit cards, credit cards, savings accounts, and all the resources. This practice is directly tied to the belief of stewardship. Key truth number nine matches up with key practice number line. I believe everything I am and everything I own belong to God. Therein lies our dividing line. Do we perceive our money, our resources to be God's or ours? When Jesus redeems our soul, he can also redeem our financial management skills or the lack thereof. He can redeem our debt, our savings, our investing, and our giving, our checkbooks, our credit cards, our savings accounts, our stocks, our bonds, our 401ks, if you have them, should all come under the authority of his leadership. As a pastor, though I'm not a financial advisor by any means, but I've had to counsel people on the topic several times through the years, and I can safely say that what keeps many professing Christians from giving is not really a lack of desire, but it's rather an abundance of debt. All too often, debt comes not near as frequently as we are tried to be led to believe from medical bills or unforeseen and unavoidable tragedies, though it happens on occasion. But the norm is it comes from intentional choices to accumulate stuff right now when we can't afford it which then places an unbearable burden for many years and prevents true freedom and blessing and giving to God and his kingdom. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaches us this, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and you'll despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Sadly, while many Christians today would say their love for God and desire to serve him, their devotion must go to serving the payments that are demanded on the first of the month. Jesus' words are as accurate today as the first day he said them. Choose you who you will serve. As we've stated with the other key ideas, we give our resources for eternal purposes to fulfill God's promises. Money will never save anybody's soul, but funds are needed to support ministries and missionaries that will reach people all around the world. If we believe the only thing that will matter in heaven will be what we have done for Christ here on earth, then the vast majority of our money that goes through our hands isn't going to count for much when we're dead and gone, except for that portion given to build his kingdom. What's the key application? What difference does this principle make in the way in which I live? Two things. One, we should intentionally give a percentage of our financial resources to fuel the purposes of God and his kingdom. We should be intentional, not casual. I'm not going to tell you that it's a mandate you give 10%. I'm going to tell you as I read the scriptures, for Shelley and I around our house, that is the base of where we start. Our goal is to get to 20%. It's our goal. We're working there. We're inching our way there. That's the base, and then it becomes offerings on top of that, and then projects on top of that. But it'd be intentional. If you say, I, 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 you're not doing anything, you start somewhere. Start at two. Work to five. To see where it goes. But here's the deal. I only know one place in all the Bible that God says, put him to a test. Only one place do I know where God says, put me to a test. And that's Malachi chapter 3. And he says, it's with your tithes and your offerings. I'd test him, folks. 
Number two, we intentionally make available the material resources God entrusted to us, not just our money, but our home, our car. Who can we invite over for dinner that needs a helping hand? Who can we give transportation to who needs some assistance getting somewhere? What clothes do I have in my closet? And instead of throwing in the garbage, I can see that prison fellowship or Heinz Hospice or some worthy cause can put them to use. How can I use my skill with tools to help somebody whose car isn't running or fence who's fallen down? But intentionally make available the material resources for the benefit of others. Here's a valuable exercise. I'll show my age. Take out your checkbook register. Those of you who do everything online, go to your online register, all right? I'm old. Actually, I'm no school at all now because Shelly is so wonderful. She handles it all, and it's all on the computer, and I know what button to push to turn it on. But go to wherever you keep track of your financial resource and ask yourself these five questions. Number one, what patterns or tendencies do I see? What priorities are evident in my spending? In Crown Ministries, they give you an assignment to do, and that is for 30 days, carry a tablet in your pocket and write down every dime you spend. See where it goes. When I did that, I challenged my other half and said, I bet you spend over 100 bucks in big gulps a month. No way. End of the month, it was $104, big gulp. Okay, now, all of you who are gapping at that, what do you spend for Starbucks? Okay. Yeah, see, I'm meddling now. What priorities are evident in your spending? Men, let me talk to you a moment. I've talked about Starbucks, primarily a female thing. Not exclusively, but primarily. Guys, how about your hobbies? What do you spend on your motorcycles? <laughs> Just pass that sheet around. What do you spend on your golf? What do you spend on your guns? What do you spend on your, you fill in the blank. Okay. <laughs> I really didn't mean to get quite that personal, but that's okay. <laughs> Number three, where am I pleased? Where am I pleased with regard to my money management? Where am I disappointed in what I've discovered? And number five, what changes should I consider making? This is great. The day a particular church's treasure resigned, the church asked the local grain elevator manager to take the position of church treasure. He agreed to do that under two conditions. One, that no treasure's report would be given for the first year. Number two, that no questions would be asked about the finances till the end of the year. A little scary. The people were surprised but finally agreed since most of them did business with him and found him to be an honorable, trustworthy man. At the end of the year, he gave to the church the financial report. The indebtedness of $228,000 paid off. Minister's salary raised 8%. Mission program gifts gone up 200%. There were no outstanding bills and there was a cash balance in the bank account of $11,252. Immediately, the shocked congregation asked this new treasure, how did you do it? Where did the money come from? He answered, most of you bring your grain to my elevator. Throughout the year, I simply withheld 10% on your behalf, and I gave it to the church in your name. You didn't even miss it. Do you see what we could do? <laughs> what the Lord could do if we were all willing to give our part? As, as you lay your finances, wasn't that a good story? I love that one. As you lay your finances before the Lord, ask, am I using the resources you've given me to accomplish your purpose? The very good news is that God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us for our past failures. He doesn't want us to experience condemnation or regret. He just wants us to see, choose, and change. So where do we start? Back to the heart of the issue. Whom will you serve? One man stated, I used to think I couldn't afford to give to God, but once I started, God's blessings were so incredible I could no longer afford not to. If you don't already know this key kingdom principle, the beginning of a new year is the perfect time to receive this truth. Remember, we are in the world, but we are not of it. Whether it takes us a few months or a few years of faithful obedience to get our financial house in order, God has the unique ability to multiply what his people offer to him 
as he did a boy with two loaves and a few fishes. And then the access to God's abundance will be given to many more. If you've been challenged by this but still have a lot of questions, we offer two ministries here at New Hope that can help. One is called Financial Peace University. Mark Addis has taught that for us about three different times here. And then Crown Ministries. The difference in those two vehicles of, of education, one can be done in a larger group. The other one is designed for small group only. If you have questions, you have concerns, you have a desire to change a bad history in the area of the grace of giving, why don't you take a card in the back of the pew and put your name on it and say financial peace, crown ministries, or help financially, and that means you want one of these two Bible studies, and we'll follow up with you and get them on our church calendar here. Would you join with me as we close in prayer? And this is a very, remember, Paul said, each of you. All of us have now heard it. You must now make a choice. Who sits on the throne of your emotions and your decision-making? Let's pray. Our Father, I'm still alive. And I only have to preach this message one more time. But thank you. I hope your grace that only comes from you was evident. But I hope the challenge, which I trust came from you, was real. You desire and you can accomplish so much through your family, working, sharing, giving together. Lead us in the direction you want us to go. In Jesus' name. God bless you. If you're visiting with us, wake up. Come see us next Sunday.